<laughs> good morning, or in your case, maybe good afternoon, or good evening, good and top, oker to, laila to, who knows, era to. From wherever you are, however you are, welcome to Medieval Church. This morning, I really wanted to kind of share with you the excitement that I'm feeling about Medieval Church. We're growing and expanding. It's almost the New Year's. It's 2013, getting ready to change over to 2014, at least in the Gregorian calendar. And uh, God decided to start an internet-based ministry called Video Church. And because of it, we're here. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad? That means that our campus is the world and our home wherever Jesus is. So if there's two or three gathered together, like you and I, then there he is in the midst of us. So wherever you are is wherever he is. And it's almost like the adventures of Buckaroo Banzai in the whatever zone. You know, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> but seriously, I am so looking forward to this journey with you to see what God is going to do through you as well as through me. Because I know, based upon my experiences with the video ministry, that it's exciting to see what God can do when only one person, even just one person, is willing to give their life, to give their heart, to give their soul, their mind, their being, their finances, their dreams, their visions, their wife, their children, their life to the Lord and to His keeping, to do what He chooses to do as He decides to use that soul. I know it's been an interesting ride these 40 years for me, that God has prepared me for such a time as this, that in these latter days, I get to wind up to be found in the faith, to be able to relate Jesus in a personal and intimate way in a setting that reminds me of the millennial who looks at his phone and is playing digitized, looks at his iPad and is playing swipe, looks at his smartphone and goes, I lost my marbles. Oh, there they are. They're both playing on my devices. And knowing that these times God has raised up Video Church, I look forward to seeing all the other ministries that are going to follow in the same footsteps. Because you see, the churches already have a digital signature out there. They just like to call it live, or they like to say that it's you know not canned, or they like to present it in some way on the big screen in the mega church. That is there really any different than what we're doing, except for we start off with the digital screen. And should we move into personal contact, hey, all so much better. Because you see, we're coming from where we are to where he is. And he's going to come into personal contact from where he is to where we are. So we look forward to starting from this interpersonal connection on a digital format to finally meeting and seeing Jesus when he arrives in person face to face. Just like I look forward to meeting you face-to-face. -face. Video Church, so that you know, is an internet-based ministry. We have Sunday morning services. We have Sunday night services. We have Bible studies. We have Sunday school. We have men's Bible studies. As a matter of fact, we have everything that you'd normally expect a church to be. We're expanding into the prayer ministry. We're getting ready to have interaction within the Google Hangouts and to have intercommunication within the framework we think of some multi-screen software that we're looking at in order to develop maybe some intimate time. You know, discipleship, you know, like fellowship and having those times where we can fellowship one with another, only guess what? The beautiful thing, the exciting thing about Video Church, the wonderful thing about being able to do this is that you don't have to leave your home. You don't have to leave your Starbucks. Whoa. You don't have to go anywhere. As a matter of fact, you could take one of your little devices and you could project it on your big screen TV. Wow. That means you could watch church in your home. 
As a matter of fact, I think that's kind of what you already are doing, aren't you, really? Be honest, come on now. You know it as well as I do. You kind of like being that couch potato watching church without having to be there in person. Because a lot of times sitting there isn't so comfortable. Oh, it's kind of nice to see the bros, you know, and the people. But guess what? We're taking it and we're inspiring other churches to do the same. That we are going to bring into that digital environment, the Internet church, so that we can have those hangouts, have that connection. So you'll see, like, maybe a few of your friends that you'll say, hey, you know what? I want to have a fellowship time with Joe and Mary and David and Fred, and they're all at home. Well, guess what? Through Video Church, we're going to proffer that, that as people get involved in this ministry, we're going to freely, always free, proffer to you and offer to you the availability and the capability of you on whatever device you have. Just simply by logging on to us or coming to see Video Church, you can meet with your friends your family members, your fellowship. That's part of what Video Church's vision is, to connect you through the Internet to the people you care about and you pray for. As a matter of fact, some of our prayer meetings will be that way. You will be at your home on your device, and through that device, you will connect with us to pray for you and to pray with you. As a matter of fact, God has inspired this in such a way that we look and see that as being the end of the world scenario. That a lot of people will, frankly, go to that because they can't really get to where everything else is happening. And so we hope that the message is as clear and as meaningful as the technology because we want that technology to inspire others to do better than we do. As a matter of fact, we bless every church that's out there, and if you've got a local church you're a part of, God bless you. Go there. Be there. But, you know, if you're in a nursing home, if you're in a hospital, if you're in your house, if you're an ungodly person and, you know, you just like to, you know, pass gas and drink beer, you know, and just don't know what you're doing here, but you're willing to go ahead and get in front of or just simply watch from your distant location a church, then you're welcome here. So we don't have a problem with who you are. Whether you're a homosexual, a murderer, or whether you're in prison, whether you're in jail, whether you're in the hospital, whether you're at home, whether you're in another church, or whether you're broadcasting us in front of a stadium live and we're up there and there's thousands of people going, Rah! <laughs> Well, we could always dream, can't we? Or whether this be canned and somehow people are analyzing it and taking it apart and saying, well, you know, we got to take this out and they did that wrong and this wrong and, you know, it's not that clear and, you know, all that stuff. Well... Guess what? That's God's department. You see, we're only called here at Video Church to do what He has told us to do. What God may use it for and what He's yet to unveil to us and reveal to us, we have yet to see. And come January, we're looking forward to that. So I wanted to be oh so wonderfully inspiring you to take a look to check back regularly, to oftentimes consider what it is that God is doing. And maybe you could do the same too. Because I can tell you this, if one man can do everything the church has done free, and he's done it on the internet with just as many people watching, then you too can go out there and through YouTube, literally, and Google, you can accomplish the same thing that mega ministries, that mega pastors, that everyone else is doing, simply by allowing yourself to be used by Jesus. Father, I thank you that you have given us Vidibo Church. I thank you that you have inspired us to go one step farther than Vidibo, one step farther than emotional, to constantly be stepping forward to answer the call, to respond to your spirit, to be filled with your joy, to be anointed by your love, to be oh so excited by the peace of God that passes all understanding that in these latter days when everyone is losing their mind and don't know which way to go, we are the answer. It's Jesus. <laughs> we are the solution. It's video. <laughs> we have the opportunity to go where no man has gone before, to boldly proclaim the gospel, even in nations that do not receive the gospel, because if we can send a signal there, we can get there with Jesus. So, God, I thank you that you've raised up video church to remind the church what it's all about. Jesus to remind the church what we're all about, the gospel, 
to lift you up, Jesus, and to make sure that there is people out there who not only have seen, but have heard and have handled for themselves the word of God, that they may make a choice based upon an intelligent decision to follow you and not to follow man. So God, I thank you that you have done this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. And amen. And a woman, and a child, and a dog, a cat. Matter of fact, your cat may be watching this more often than you are, huh? <laughs> For some people, that's true. Yeah. We wanted to take a look at Joshua. You know, Joshua was interesting because that's really the name of Jesus. I don't know if you knew that, but Joshua means God is salvation, or the salvation of God, or God saves. And that's what Jesus' Hebrew name is, Yehoshua, Joshua, Joshua. And being that he was a, quote-unquote, person presented to read Torah or would go into the temple, and he was able to be presented to read Torah, his name in the temple scrolls would have been Yehoshua, Joshua, which makes it kind of interesting because, you know, we come up with Jesus, which is his family name or his nickname. Yeshua would be the Hebrew way of saying Jesus. Jesus comes from Yehoshua, which we know is Greek, which you take it back to the Hebrew, and you find it from the kind of Aramaic Hebrew cross dialect, or from the didactic dialect, from which comes from that portion of Judea, that at that time had multiple languages that were mixed in together with the Hebrew, that you would have said, talking to each other, Yeshua ben Nazareth, which is Jesus of Nazareth. But if you were in temple, he would have been Yehoshua ben Yosef. In other words, Joshua or Yehoshua ben David. Because ben David was a title that signified that he was of the lineage, that he would be in the, the possibilities of being that holy person that would come that would one day lead Israel again, as King David did. But being presented as the son of David, being presented as the son of Joseph, this would have been Jesus spoken of by those who knew him in the temple. Yehoshua, Joshua. So when you're looking at the book of Joshua, it's kind of interesting to think about Jesus at times in it, or Joshua as a type of it, because there's a very close similarity when you study it. And that's one of the things that's exciting about looking at the Word of God. You find out new nuggets, new nodules, things to possibly inspire you to look at the Word of God in a different way. And I hope that we can do that all the time, whether from Hebrew, whether from Yiddish, <laughs> who knows, might be something there, such a deal, or from the Aramaic, or from the Greek, but we don't want to get so intellectual or so intelligent that we go beyond what the Scripture says, because in reality, it's all about Jesus. And when it's all about Jesus, we should be able to see him in the midst of the Word of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I think you just went through Christmas. Now, maybe some of you went through Hanukkah. Boy, <laughs> maybe not. I don't really do Hanukkah. But I don't really do Christmas either, so it's like, yeah, throw them both out. I don't care. <laughs> I just go about my business anyways. And some years, I'll admit, you know, I decorate. You know, I mean, I remember last year, I think it was 20, what was last year, 2012, I was living in a different apartment complex, and my wife and I, well, we decorated the apartment complex, and as a matter of fact, they had a little mini contest about decorating, so we came up with these things that we had because we were just enjoying it, and we went to the 99 cent store, and we didn't have any money because every year at Christmas, we never have any money. We're broke, but we had a little bit of money, and we spent, you know, about 20 bucks, I think, you know, on lights and these little weird decorations, and I constructed this kind of like Santa and this kind of like reindeer and this thing to hang over our banner, you know, as a long banner that was lit up at night, and then we decorated what we had and what we could do, you know, all around our house and, you know, outside, and we won. We actually won a $50 gift certificate that we took and bought a bunch of cookies for everybody and put them all into little Christmas bags and passed them out to everybody in the apartment complex. I mean, it was like a lot of people, so it cost us more than 50 bucks. <laughs> oh, well, we went broke. But we built a reputation of consideration of the relationship that I had because I used to record video votes outside and everybody knew that I was recording devotionals. Everybody could hear them from my outside porch. Everybody knew that I was sharing Jesus. And so since they knew that, when we passed them out a token of our appreciation and love, you know, at the time of Christmas, being that that's what usually happens when you give at Christmas rather than get, 
they were all blessed. So we got a chance to bless others at Christmas. Well, this year, you know, I personally didn't have anything to bless people with and was broke. So guess what? We didn't do Christmas. <laughs> My wife did. She went with her family. You know, she enjoyed it. You know, she was with her kids, you know, and they do all these kind of goofy traditions like, you know, get in pajamas and do all this other stuff, you know, but nah, not for me. You know, if I can't give, I don't want to get. So it's like, you know, and I don't want to get because I'd rather give. So that's the way I deal with Christmas and Hanukkah. And I'm sure that you got blessed doing what you do with your family or with your friends or your neighbors or your relatives. Me, I just like to share Jesus. You know, it's kind of like, that's what I do for the rest of my life. Now, come see me after, you know, the millennium, and hey, maybe we'll talk about Christmas. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> but now that Christmas is over, I got kind of one week in between, you know, to get things ready for video church. You know, it's like, oh boy, we're going to church, yeah. I'm getting excited about it again. And so, having removed myself from, you know, stumbling anyone, God knows I don't want to trip them up on their own ideas about what Christmas is or isn't or was or shall be or ever could be, you know, because we know it's just a celebration, so you can celebrate every day. You know, For me, every day is a celebration. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice. There's a good way to celebrate. Or this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Or God causes the rain to fall and the sun to shine on the wicked and the good. So every day we've got a good reason why we should celebrate. But there are times and seasons, there are purposes under the sun, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to rejoice, a time to cry, a time to weep, a time to dance, a time to sing, a time to shout, a time to remember. And that's kind of what we're doing now as we look back on 2013 and we look forward to 2014. In Hebrew, we call it remember and observe. Want me to do that again? Remember and observe. Remember? Oh, well, it doesn't work the other way around. Sorry. Actually, we go from Hebrew, we go this way, that way, but not that way, this way. So, remember, observe, remember, observe, remember, observe. Because we remember the days of old. We remember what God had done, and we, rem and we observe what God is doing. That's what the two Shabbat candles are meant to be for. You know, it's that there to remember and observe. It's not the law and the prophets. It's, you know, kind of like... Every Hebrew, you know, scholar that you talk to or every Jewish rabbi or anybody that you talk to is going to come up with some other explanation about why they have two. But, you know, guess what? It's between me and you. Just remember and observe. That was what's been around from the olden days. And that's kind of what you can trust when you read the Bible and see it in the Word of God. Remember and observe. Remember these things that you have done and gone through and observe to do these things that I tell you. That's what God said to the children of Israel in Egypt. So, you know, you remember and observe. And that's what it's always been. And now they change it modern days. And just like Christianity is trying to change the history of America, well, Jewish culture has done the same thing. They changed the Jewish culture. That's why Hanukkah is celebrated as a holy day when it's really not true. <laughs> uh, it's a uh, invented. It's not real. There's no oil. The Hanukkah is, you know, like a deviant variation of a menorah. <laughs> wasn't designed by anybody inspired by God. <laughs> Sorry. I know that, you know, <laughs> Hasids really got into it. You know, they want to use it to unify the people, just like uh, the Hasmonians did the same thing back with the Maccabees, you know, and they also were perverted priesthood, and they wanted to change things, you know. Sorry. And they killed Jews in order to stop them from worshiping, you know, false idols, which they called the Greeks, you know, and the Hellenistic Jews, which they later became Hellenistic anyways. Oh, maybe that's when, you know, the temple, when it got desecrated, the Spirit of God left it because the Spirit of God went to be inside of a man, and that became Jesus. And Jesus, when he came, because he presented himself in the temple, there was no Spirit of God in the temple because, guess what? He had already left the temple and <laughs> was inside of Jesus. Ooh, ouch. Oh, well. Yeah, Hanukkah is a made-up holiday. It's been proven. Sorry. It's just one of those rabbi tricks. And everybody knows it, you know, but they try to use it anyways. And that's kind of one of the things about Jewish culture is that they'll do the same thing that Catholic culture did. And the Catholics brought us, you know, kind of a play on dates to change the Christmas, the Mass for Christ, birth or, you know, Annunciation to 25th of December. So, you know, the Jews say, hey, what the heck, let's go ahead and do our own inventions. So they did the same thing. And there's that spirit that goes out in the world that often does that, the spirit of compromise. You know, and sadly, a lot of people like to indulge in that spirit. It's not the spirit of Christmas. <laughs> Oops. Oh, well. But getting to the Word of God, we can always have an assurance that by the Spirit of God, 
God will teach his people the truth. You will always be able to hear God's voice. You will all be able to walk, always be able to walk in his word. You will always be able to be taught of God. God promised that. He said, if you will hear my voice and listen to my word, then you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. If you would call upon me, you shall be saved. If you would receive the Holy Spirit, he, when he has come, will instruct you and guide you and teach you and fill you with his spirit. He will give you light in the darkness. He will instruct you in the way that you should go. He will give you ears to hear. He will give you eyes to see. He will heal you. He will instruct you. He will teach you. He will be your comforter. Wow. If God will do all those things, what do we need people for? I didn't say that, but let me inspire you. You don't really need anybody to teach you. You have no need, the Bible says, of any man teach you, but the Spirit of God who dwells within you, he will teach you all things. Part of the reason you go to church is to be provoked. Yeah, to rub off on each other. You know, to really hate that person you're sitting next to, that they stink or smell or something. You learn how to get along, and once you get out of the sandbox, you go out and do the things that God tells you to do. Get along. Well, God wants you to go a little farther than that. He wants you to love your enemies. Ooh, I don't like that. Yeah, I know. But what we're going to do is we're going to look back on in making resolutions to not do what we've done before, but to do what we know we ought to do. You see, remembering and observing is to remember the things that God has done and remember the things maybe we didn't do and remember the things we did do, if they're good, and to observe the things we could do and to observe the things God did do and to observe the things God will do. Because God is coming to judge the world. He is going to bring judgment. And judgment has come into the world because of Jesus, but he only came in that way because men love darkness more than they love light so that if they're still hiding in darkness, then they've already been judged. So judgment came into the world. It's already been accomplished. It's already over. Judgment's been done. Boom, you're going to hell. Sorry, but if you came to the light, as he is in the light, then you have fellowship one with another, then obviously judgment has come to you and you have found salvation because when the light came, you said, I want to go with the light. Follow the light, as they say when you die. Follow the light. <laughs> Not the fire, the light. Don't get those two mixed up. But if you follow the light, then you will find at the end of that tunnel, Jesus. And Jesus will stand before you and he will say, have you done the things I said? Have you clothed the naked? Have you fed the poor? Have you, you know, visited me in prison? Have you taken, you know, literally what I said to you, literally, you know, when I spoke on the Sermon on the Mount and loved your enemies? Have you done all these things? Or rather, are you just saying you know me and you've done miracles for me and you've done, you know, marvelous works for me and you built beautiful structures and you donated your money and you did this, that, and the other thing, but you were still didn't know me. Did you hear my voice? Did you walk in my ways? Did you do my will? And you'll be able to tell, know beforehand, because as soon as you see Jesus, you won't recognize him, because he won't look like what you think, unfortunately. But if he has known you and you do know him, then you will recognize him because you'll recognize his voice, because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me, and they will not follow the voice of another. So when you present yourself before Jesus, you won't be like that unprofitable servant who says, oh man, I knew you were tough, I knew you were rough, so I took what I had and I buried it and I hid it. You know, and Jesus says, get away from me, cast you out in outer darkness. Or he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you, the things you've done in my name. You see, it is, and always has been, about knowing Jesus. So, maybe we need to know Jesus better. So, I would say a New Year's resolution, the first one is to know Jesus. What? <laughs> no, seriously. The first most important thing in all of your life, in all of your ways, in all of your days, and everywhere you go, and everything you do, and anywhere you've been, and everything you're going to do in the new year is know Jesus. Number two I put right next to it is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You're liable to go diving off a cliff or jumping into, you know, a, a burning fire or running into a house that's smoking, you know, because you like thrill-seeking. No. But because circumstances will dictate to you to do something that if you don't check in first, it's liable to get you killed. I'm just telling you what could happen in 2014. But see, that's why we want to have resolutions. We want to resolve it in our hearts now. 
to do and to know what we will do later so that we would not do those things that are unprofitable to us or that literally could get us kicked out of heaven and sent to hell or put us into jeopardy where we don't accomplish the purpose God designed us for. That's the New Year's resolution, is to accomplish and fulfill all that God wants for us. So let's look at the Word of God to see what God had said to the children of Israel and what God had done to the children of Israel and what God was doing with the children of Israel. Because we want to remember and observe all the things that He's commanded us. In Joshua 24, you can read along if you like, or if you just want to listen, praise the Lord. You know where you are. You know what you do. You can trust me or not. I personally trust in the Lord and not me. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and they multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. And I gave unto Isaac Jacob and Esau, and I gave unto Esau Mount Seir, to possess it, but Yaakov and his children went down into Egypt. I sent Moses also in our own, and I plagued Egypt, according to that which I did among them, and afterward I brought you out. Yes, I'm using the English to speak in a Hebrew accent. Oi! <laughs> okay, we'll make it simple. And I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came unto the sea, and the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea. And when they cried unto the Lord, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and brought the sea upon them, and covered them, and your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt, and you dwelt in the wilderness a long season. You know, I always wonder about these people that go out and get guns. You know, he says, look, you guys saw what I did. Now you're going to go out and buy guns? That ought to help. Good luck with that. Sorry, commentary excluded. <laughs> And I brought you into the land of the Amor oh, that's right, we're doing it the English way, Amorites, which dwelt on the other side of Jordan, and they fought with you, and I gave them into your hand that you might possess their land, and I destroyed from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel, and sent and called ba Balaam, I just practice learning how to do it in Hebrew, and then I have to practice and learn how to undo it. Baalam, or Balaam, yeah, Balaam, I know Balaam, Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam, therefore he blessed you still, so I delivered you out of his hand. And you went over Jordan and came, you know, I just suddenly realized, now I understand why people are blessing Israel instead of, you know, saying, Israel, straighten up, you guys are ungodly, you know, you're persecuting Christians, you're doing all kinds of things, and yet the Christians are running around telling you to, to you know, bless Israel. They're acting like Balaam. Who? Sure hope a jackass doesn't have to come to warn them. Because I keep telling them to quit blessing Israel and standing with Israel. Start witnessing to Israel. It's what you're told to do. Wait a minute. Maybe a jackass did just tell people what to do. And I would not hearken unto Balaam. Therefore he blessed you still, so I delivered you out of his hand. And you went over Jordan and came unto Jericho. Uh, it's kind of funny, you know, it hit me. It's like, yeah, well, you know, okay, we got it, Lord. You know. Me and God, we had these conversations while we're doing things all the time. And you went over Jordan and came unto Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you, the Amorites and the Parasites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I delivered them into your hand. And I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword and not with thy bow, not with your three fifty seven Magnum and not with your shotgun, not with your rifle and not with your armor systems, not with your alarm systems and not with calling the police. I sent them out with what? A hornet. Is that in there? And I gave, and I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you built not, and you dwelt in them. Of the vineyards and the olive yards which you planted not, did you eat. Now, therefore, fear the Lord, 
and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God. He it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt, out from the house of bondage, and which did those great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all the way wherein we went, and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out, drove out from before you, and the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites, which dwelt in the land. Therefore will we also serve the Lord, for he is our God. And Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you, and after that he hath done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. Really? And Joshua said unto the people, You are witnesses against yourselves, that you have chosen you the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore put away, saith he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and set them a statue and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto you, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke unto us, it shall therefore be a witness unto you, and lest you deny your God. I'm watching you. I'm a stone. So Joshua let the people depart, every man unto his inheritance. And it came to pass after these things that Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Tinnasera, which is in Mount Ephraim, in the north side of the hill of Gosh. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. And the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem in a parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver, and it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. And Eleazar the son of Aaron, died. And they buried him in a hill that pertained to Phinehas, his son, which was given him in Mount Ephraim. And so it is, and so it shall be, and ever can be, that we should choose not just the portion of the scripture that says, Oh yeah, of course, you know, we choose to serve the Lord, because that's what the children of Israel said, and yet later they disobeyed. But rather, we should choose to listen to the words of the prophet as he spoke, prophesying and declaring that, No, you won't serve the Lord. You'll turn your back on him. You'll forget the works of the Lord. You'll forget what God has done. You'll forget that he delivered you out of Egypt. You'll forget that there was a Jesus movement. You'll forget that there were miracles done. You'll forget that the speaking in of tongues and the gifts of the Spirit and walking in the Spirit and being able to talk in the Spirit and being lifted up into the heavens and being able to see God and being able to hear God. Oh, no. You'll forget that. But you'll remember that there are people out there that, oh, we got to defend, we got to protect, we got to give rights to, we got to give privileges to. We won't seek the Lord to serve him, but we'll seek to serve ourselves and offer up the gods of other men that have come before us, the gods that were there on the other side of the flood, the gods that are of commerce, the gods of free enterprise, the gods of freedom of speech, the gods of our rights and privileges that we have from our forefathers that came here in protest and came here to make money and came here to set up penal colonies that didn't come here in order to start a godly nation a Christian nation. As a matter of fact, within the first few years of there being a Christian nation, there were Christians being burned at the stake as witches. Don't tell me what gods you serve unless you're serving the living God. You see, 
God has said that we can hear his voice. God has said that we can listen to his speaking to us. God has said that we should not follow after those gods that were before the flood. God has said that we should choose you this day whom we'll serve. You be a witness and a testimony for your own household, for your own life. You make your New Year's resolution to decide what you will do. Because as for me and my house, we're done. Video Church, you see it, you live it, you're a part of it. You are my brethren. And I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, by the grace I've been given, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you because of what Jesus has done. You are a holy nation. You are a holy priesthood. You have been made holy by the blood of the cross that has been given to you, by the blood of Jesus who has died for you, by the very fact that Jesus came, lived, and has been resurrected from the dead because he gave himself for you that you should live for him, that you should serve him, that you should do as he's telling you to do. So I ask you again, in these latter days, knowing that the end of the world has come, knowing that the end of all things is at hand, knowing that the great tribulation is going to come upon the world and you will not be able to make a decision of whether you will serve by grace, because you will serve by fear. Then I beseech you again, brethren, by the mercies of God, present yourselves this holy day, this day coming forward and going forward as a declaration to the Lord your God. Serve him with love or serve him with fear, but for God's sake, for your family's sake, for the nation's sake, serve the Lord, because he's near. He is in your very lips. He's in your very home. He's in your very heart. He's all about you. He wants to speak to you. Listen to what he has to say to you. Read the word. Discover and uncover what it is that God would declare to you for this new year. Would you go back to what you've been? Serving after the land and the politics? The gun fightings? The issue fightings? Serving to serve yourself by commerce? Or would you have mercy upon those around you who are dying and going to hell? Would you feed the hungry? Would you clothe the naked? Would you have mercy upon the poor? Would you, in fact, give up your job, your wife, your house, your home, your life to serve the Lord your God? Because that's the times we live in. The end is here. You have no more time left. You have maybe five years max, maybe less, probably less. Most people are pretty predicting that, oh, you know, maybe 2015, you know, maybe 2017. And a lot of people that have a wonderful idea of just a Sugarland grace ride, you know, that we're going to go from Graceland in, in Presleyville, you know, to just kind of sing our way into heaven, are in for a rude surprise. It costs Jesus Christ the Garden of Gethsemane, to learn obedience, as well as the things that he suffered throughout his life. If they have so persecuted the master, then they will so persecute the servants. If it costs the master his life, then do you think that you'll get by without having to do anything in your life? Have you considered what it costs to be saved? Yes, freely you receive, freely give. Yes, grace has been given to you, but that grace may take you into the tribulation period, or the great tribulation even worse, because the times are changing. It has come upon us. If you are not loving your enemies now, you will not love your enemies later. If you are not serving the Lord your God now, you likely will not serve him later. If you don't understand that they're probably going to take your children now, you'll be shocked when they take your children later and offer them as a sacrifice before your eyes to make you deny or to accept the mark of the beast. Would you... Rather choose this day whom you will serve. Because you can serve those gods. They're coming. There's no doubt. You'll see it. If you don't get right, you'll get left. If you don't get ready, you'll be left behind. If you are not prepared to meet Jesus today, you're not going to meet him tomorrow. Choose you this day whom you will serve. That's the warning. That's the blessing. That's the curse. You see... For us, who have served the Lord our God for 40 years now, we look forward to the day of the new year. Oh, God, one day closer to you coming for us. 
Oh, Lord, I pray you find me acceptable, a willing sacrifice. I offer you all of my life, everything I have. If there be any wicked way in me, then cleanse me from within. If there's anything that's coming between you and me, Jesus, take it away. If even money itself in this land that I live in is the problem, take me out of it. But God, kill me now, lest I deny you later. Better to perish than to burn. For the reality of your life, the reality of your salvation, is it meant in your great exaltation of worship when everything is hunky-dory? But rather when the chips are down, when things are going south, as they often do, when things aren't quite as beautiful as you think they are, when Beulah land has turned into desert land, will you deny Jesus? Are you even now turning your back on the living God to serve the gods of men? Because in this land of America, oh, there are many gods. We set up idols everywhere we go. As a matter of fact, you can turn on the television and change your idol channel to one to another. And you know as well as I do that some of those channels are idols, even American Idol. Even your favorite rock star? What's up with that? Isn't that the world in its ways and you know it? What's up with this return to all the old rock artists? You know, I even see Christian artists now are getting involved back with the old music. What's up with that? You going back to the gods of men again? Or do we see that Keith Green was right? That we are compromised and we want to go back to Egypt. As a matter of fact, we live in the land of Egypt. And we are participating in the gods before the flood. And then we are doing the same thing the gods did then. Football. Is there any different than the football of today and the Colosseum of yesteryear? What's the difference? Whether it be serving that and seeing men getting beat up and suffering the consequences of that? Tell me the gospel is being proclaimed to a guy who has just suffered brain damage for the rest of his life? Oh, yeah. The money is still there, though. Oh, well, I'm glad we got that covered. Let's be honest. If it's the end of the world, do you really want to be known as a football player? If it's the end of the world, do you really want to be remembered by your children in the millennium? What did you do in the war, Daddy? Well, you know, I kind of like uh, left tackle. I threw balls. Really, Daddy? That's what you did? Yeah, I threw balls, and I figured if I made it one day, I'd start talking about God. Oh, well, I'm impressed. So is God. You see, it's not about whether you're a Christian baseball player, football player, basketball player, whether you serve in the military, whether you serve the other gods, the question is, what are you serving? The question is, you know if you're serving the Lord or not. You know if you sat down and prayed about joining the military, because the military owns you. They do. And if you're serving the power of the military, then you may be sent to Armageddon. You may have to, quite frankly, Become a traitor to your country so that you could be faithful to your God. You may have to be a traitor to your branch of service so that you could serve the living God. Because if you're going to take orders and go to Megiddo, you're stupid. And I can tell you straight up, you won't survive that encounter at all. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Write for yourself a resolution. Make it known to people around you so they'll hold you accountable to that. Find yourself a sanctuary, a Shechem, that you might be able to put a penny in or a Shechem in, a very minute part of your monetary gain, that will remind you to serve the living God than to serve your idea of him. Because if God isn't telling you what to do, then who is? If God isn't telling you specifically, audibly, orally, visually, specifically, intellectually, emotionally, and with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, something you can put your faith into eternity, then who are you serving? Because it's easy to serve a religion, and many people do. Ah, the pastor said, good luck with that when you're standing in heaven all alone. Well, the church said, well, good luck with that one too. Well, the Bible said, good luck with that one. Because if it isn't what Jesus said to you today, it doesn't profit you anything at all. At all. The study of the scriptures and the study of the intellectual preparation of your mind is to conform your mind into being transformed into the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is the perfect and acceptable will of God, which is this, knowing Jesus, knowing the Father, hearing his voice, walking in his will, doing his word, accomplishing his purposes. It's not about reading and trying to interpret it. 
It's about hearing his voice. You know that. You do know that, right? You understand that, don't you? You're very well aware that Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. Because the same thing that you're going to say that you follow in Joshua is kind of an interesting statement, isn't it? We find in Joshua making a very interesting thing. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And everybody knows that scripture. But what is the portion of the scripture you don't know? What is the thing that you haven't heard? What is that portion that maybe you haven't considered that you haven't put in your mindset to realize what Joshua has said, what Joshua, even the name being Jesus, has said to you? As the first Joshua said it, so too the last Joshua has said it. And he's saying it unto you this day, even as you get to choose which way you will serve. Because as we look into verse 24 of Joshua 24, remember that. 48 hours, and you're in trouble. Guess what? 24 in the past, 24 in the future. What does it say? And the Lord and the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. I read all of what God had done. And I say, follow the works. Like Jesus said, fine. Believe on Jesus because of the works. I look at all that God had done with the children of Israel. And we say, well, how could they not have followed? How can you not? I look at everything that God had said to them and everything that God had prepared for them and everything that God delivered them from, and they did nothing. They had to do nothing. Even a bee was chasing out their enemies. And yet today we turn our back on God and we use every other means available to us except for obeying his voice, except for hearing his voice. I ask you today not to choose the Lord your God because that's easy to say. I'm saying to you on this New Year's resolution that you need to make, obey the voice of your God and hear his voice. Because if you're not hearing his voice, I got news for you. You're hearing somebody's voice. And you may not be walking in the will of his way and walking in the way of his will, deciding for yourself what you think God's will is rather than listening to what God has said. James 1.5 is pretty specific about if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who prayed it not, but give it to him and liberally simply because Jesus said we could hear his voice. Joshua said we could hear his voice. All the way through the scriptures, it talks about God speaking to individuals. What is your problem? The children of Israel said, we all as a nation will hear his voice and obey his word and obey his will. They weren't talking about reading it. They didn't have it to read. They heard God speak. God spoke to them. God speaks to you every day. Every day, God is directing his voice to you. As we're told in the book of Revelation that even all the way through the entire scenery of God pouring out his wrath upon the world, the gospel is going forth and the voice of God is being spoken from the heavens. Come unto me. Come. Come. Jesus says the spirit and the bride say come. Jesus says the father says come. Jesus says I say come. What are you doing with your life? What are you choosing to do with this new year? What are you going to do with your household, with your possessions? What are you really? What have you become really? Are you serving the gods of men? Or have you heard the voice of God speaking to you now? Is God trying to get through to you so that you'll shut up? So that you'll unplug your ears and unplug your iPads and unplug your digital formulas and suddenly get alone with God and fall down on your face in the dust and, and cry out and throw up just like ashes the dirt from whence you come from because the dirt from whence you were returned to with this body of flesh that you live in because you have not sought the Lord your God until this moment now in your life and you know, you know you've gone out of your way to prepare for your wife. You've gone out of your way to make for yourself a life. You've gone out of your way to get your job, to get your car, to get your possessions. And God says, no! It's all going to burn. No! It's ending. No, as Jesus said, oh, we'll build bigger barns and we'll add more to it. No, 
you're not going to have another year. No, you don't get to see your children grand, your children's grandchildren or grandchildren grow up. No, you will not see this nation rise to some kind of revival. No, you'll see it peer away its inheritance, even as it's already done. What will you do this day as you see all these things happening? Will you love more? Well, that's not a bad thing to do. Maybe I should. Will you help more? Well, you know, that's a good thing, and maybe I should do that. Will you go to church more often? Well, you know, it's not a bad thing, maybe I should do that. Or will you listen to the voice of your God and obey Him? I got news for you. You could avoid the Great Tribulation. You might be able to avoid some tribulation if you'll just listen to what God says to you every day. Now, I know, you know, there's going to be people that are going to come up and say, No, Michael, you can't tell them to listen to God. Tell them to read your Bible. I don't frankly give a damn if you read your Bible. You can read it if you want to or read it if you don't want to. Because some people that read it, they will know whether or not they are hearing from the voice of the Lord their God. But some people don't hear a word from reading their Bible or get anything out of it. As a matter of fact, go ahead and tell me about the Mormons that read their Bible every day. Tell me about the Hasids that read their Bible every day. Tell me about Jewish people that read their Bible every day. Tell me about all the Jehovah's Witnesses that read their Bible every day. Tell me about all the other people that read their Bible every day, including Satan himself. Well, okay, he reads people every day. Close enough. Oh, they know their Bible. Some of them, not the ones that are reading, but Satan does. The fact of the matter is, it's not enough. What is enough is if you hear his voice. If you choose to read your Bible, that will help you, yes. If you choose to go to church, that will help you, yes. If you choose to ask people into your life, that will help you, yes. But if you don't choose this day to hear the voice of the Lord your God and obey, then you will fall away. You will go astray. You will seek after that Jesus that is just, you know, sugar-coated and oh so sweet that, you know what? Who cares if we go into Great Tribulation? We're going with all the other happy people, too. Because only 50% of those who claim to know the Lord are even possible of going. And of that 50%, one-seventh of those even have the likelihood of going. And of that one-seventh, Jesus said, pray you be counted worthy to be spared of all these things that were going to happen. Oh, and of that, half of those, Jesus says, hey, of the people that are looking for my return, only half entered in. Whoa. Oh. Whoa. Well, you know, maybe I'll just go into a great tribulation. Your choice. Maybe I'll just, you know, kind of like, you know, shine it on for now. Your choice. You see, I'm not going to stop you from being stupid. I'm not going to stop you from, you know, being like Balaam on that jackass. You really want to keep going forward, go ahead. Because that angel will kill you. You really think that you're protected with your guns, with your rights, with your civil liberties, with all these things that you think you own in America? Dead by a gangbanger. One heartbeat. That's all it takes. Twinkling of an eye. You're toast. Stray bullet comes through. When the time is up, the time is up. There's nothing you can do to stop it. There's nothing you, do, you need to do to prevent it. If it's not the providence of God, if it's not the will of God, if God is protecting you, you have nothing to fear. Jesus said to all of his disciples every time, fear not. You don't got to worry. What are you worried about? We just read in Joshua how he used a bee to drive out the enemies. They did nothing. They even got houses to live in. They even got fields that were full of vineyards. They even got jobs and vocations. God gave them them. They didn't have to do anything at all. Not even go out and look. Don't tell me that you don't work, you don't eat. No, you don't listen, you don't get. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. For everyone that asks, receives, and everyone that seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it shall be opened. Because Jesus said it. Jesus said it. Jesus did it. What are you going to do? What are you doing? What will you do in 2014? Write it down. 
Write down Joshua 24, 24. See if I'm like exaggerating. Check me out. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord, if I won't open up the treasures of heaven and pour out for upon you a blessing. And it doesn't have to do with money. Tithes and offerings had nothing to do with money. It had to do with meat in the house to eat. Hello? Bring the cattle so people, poor people could eat. Hello? Sorry, you got the wrong perspective. It was paying for the priests to take care of the temple, not the pastor to get an education, you know, by being provided for by the people. That's supposed to be a different kind of offering. Hello? You're not a Levite. No, you're not. My point is this. How can you know these things? How can you do these things? How can you understand these things? Three things have to happen in your life in order to do them. Three things. Very simple. The ABCs of Christianity. One, you must be born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. You must be born again. That which is born from above has come down from above and will return to above. That is what God said. Jesus told Nicodemus the same. And Nicodemus said, well, how can you do it? He said, with man it's impossible, with God it is possible. God can come and dwell in you. You ask him into your life. You ask to be saved. You ask Jesus to take over your life. Two, you must be born of the Spirit of God, but you must be filled with the Spirit. In other words, you must have the Spirit of God that God promised to give you so that the Comforter would come and be inside you to teach you, to give you ears to hear that you might hear what the Spirit of God says, to have eyes to see what the Word of God says to the people of God that they might follow the Son of God and know the Father of Jesus, to know God. Because without the Spirit of God, you cannot know God. You cannot understand the things of the Spirit. You cannot follow Jesus. And the last thing is to obey what you hear today. In other words, you hear his voice. Just like it says there, choose you this day whom you will serve. Will you obey the voice of your Oh, yeah, we'll do it. Yep, 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 yep. Then you're your own witness. You choose of those three things to do, and you will be in heaven with God and with me. We will celebrate together at the feasting banqueting table, rejoicing in the goodness of our God that has set a banqueting table in the presence of our enemies. We will walk right now by still pastures. We will, in the presence of our enemies, enjoy by the valley of the shadow of death, we're laughing and singing and presenting ourselves before God with no fear of what the enemy might do out there because God is in here. Choose you this day whom you'll serve. You don't need to fear. I don't care what nation you're in. I don't care what situation. I don't care what your relationship is. Whether you live or whether you die, we will serve the living God. The children of Israel said in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Mishael, Mishael, and whoever. <laughs> Abishai, I don't know. <laughs> Forget the Hebrew names. But they said, look, we don't care. We've had it. We know God can take us. Or God could cause us to live. Who cares? What are you going to do with faith like that? What are you going to do with a God like that? What are you going to do with a witness like that? What are you going to do in the new year to be a witness? Will you be your own witness against yourself? Or you will you be a testimony to the truth? Choose you. In other words, you choose. It's your choice. I know mine. I know mine for 40 years now, and I'll tell you about miracles. As you stay with Video Church, you'll hear about miracles. Hey, man, we'll talk about, you know, raising the dead. Well, you know, within reason, you know, I don't think I've done it, but, you know, I know other people that have. But, you know, we'll talk about healings. Oh, yeah, no problem there. We'll talk about speaking in tongues. We'll talk about all the miracles. We'll talk about going into heaven and coming back. You know, not quite like the way that they talk about on, you know, like selling books and some of these popular movie shows. Uh, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe not. You know, we'll see how it goes. But we'll talk about the miraculous that is part of the normal experience of a Christian, a born-again Christian, a Jesus freak, a person who's been there from the beginning, who will tell you 40 years later, it's still the same today as it was back then. I see God every day. I hear from him. He speaks to me. I got out of the tub. He was still talking to me. <laughs> Even during this recording, I was going, yeah, okay, Lord, whatever. <laughs> it's like, you know, when you have a relationship with God, it's a joy. It's not a burden. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light, man. I give to God every day. But I can tell you this. The 
end of the world has come. Jesus is coming soon. But the end of this age, the time of the Gentiles has been fulfilled. The accomplishment of the purposes that God is now working on is with the children of Israel. He has once again began to work with that nation and begin to change the heart of the people from being cold, calloused, rejecting the living God, even as they do today. Right now, in the nation of Israel, they do not want God to come. Period. At all. As a matter of fact, I can tell you most Jews don't really want God in their life, just like most Christians don't want God in their life, because they don't want to have to deal with God that's real. Because at least Jewish mind is pretty real. Jewish mind is pretty practical this way. I want to be selfish. I want to do what I want to do. I don't want somebody telling me what to do. I want to go do my own thing. And that's what a Jewish mindset is about right now. They don't want God in their life. And Moses and Elijah are going to come and straighten that out. Very dramatically. Very huh, uh, miraculously. Huh. And they aren't going to be pleasant about it. So, choose you this day. You want the easy way? Hey, there it is. Be loved. Enjoy it. Participate with it. Choose whom you'll serve and see if you'll be a witness about your own life, about yourself. Or whether your witness really is your worst nightmare because your life is your witness. And it's a nightmare of bad choices, not doing what God said, and not living according to what his will was. But I can tell you this, if you will choose to change your life, if you'll choose to turn it around, if you'll choose right now to ask God into your life, he'll take it. He'll make it a witness and a testimony as bright as the sun shining in the day, as bright as the brightest star you see at night, and he will use you in a way that will blow your mind because it's the end of time. And it's time for those who are of the children of God to be revealed as the men and women of God. And God could take you this day in your weakness and make you strong. He can make you filled with his spirit and cause you to be, wow, at the last, you were the greatest. For the first shall be last and the last shall be first. That whether you're a homosexual, yeah, you. Whether you're a murderer, yeah, you. Whether you're a criminal, yeah, you. Whether you're a Christian, yeah, you. Whether you're a pastor, yeah, you. Whether you're any human being at all that has been created by God himself, God can use you. And I don't care what condition you're in right now. Stop. Look. Listen. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods from the other side of the flood, the gods from before, or the gods that are here today, or the gods that are ready to perish soon, tomorrow. You choose. You decide. I am the Lord your God, maker of heaven and earth. I have provided all things for you. I have given you my son. I have given you my prophets. I have given you my teachers. I have given you my word. I have given you the opportunity today, now, to hear my voice. Father, I thank you that you have given us all things, that you committed them unto your Son, that by Jesus, through Jesus, and in Jesus, we have salvation, that this last Joshua, who stands before us, who is seated at your right hand, has come to us to reveal your word, so that we would know we can turn it over to you. We can give you our life right now. And I ask, O oh God, you'll take our life and dedicate it and rededicate it unto you to be your witness, to let our life be a testimony of salvation or condemnation, but that you would take away our life and that you would give us your spirit. So take now, O oh God, I pray, by the Spirit of God, take our life and have mercy upon us, O oh God. Forgive us our sins, cleanse us from our unrighteousness, pardon our iniquities, Take away the sins which so easily beset us. Take away our distractions and our attractions with the world. Free us from our bondages. Separate us and sanctify us according to your will and your way. Give us, O oh God, I pray right now, salvation this day for all those who call upon your, know, your name to be saved. Hear them, O oh Lord Jesus, and forgive them. And hear and receive them as they ask that in your name. Amen. And God, I pray that those that pray whether they say all that or just simply say, help, hear them for your name's sake, for the sake of your son, for what he's done. And then give them now as they've given you the life, 
that they had, give them the life that you lived. Fill them with your Holy Spirit, overflowing, that they can go forward today and go forward in the new year, committed in a way that they are a witness and a testimony of what Jesus has done and Jesus is doing and Jesus will perform even to the perfecting of his saints, making them become from what they were to what they shall be. And that is perfect and blameless and spotless before the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, before the maker of heaven and earth, that they and we and I and all of us will be one in the Son, looking at you and realizing we are one. Amen. <laughs> Isn't that what you want to do? Don't you want to win? I do. It's been a long life. A long life. It's been filled with sorrows and joys, happiness, excitement. It's been ecstatic and it's been emotional. It's been the heights of the mountains and the depths of the valleys. It's been the rivers and the oceans. It's been the starlight and the snow flight. It's been the hot drizzards. It's been even some of the despairing times, the darkness that was so easily upon me. I've seen the possibilities of the utter cataclysmic of despair when you look at yourself and you decide to end it all. I've seen the joys of knowing what it's like to be lifted up into the heavens and to run and to want to keep going when God says go back and to keep going from the lowest heavens to the highest knowing that if you continued on you'd never come back. Oh, I know what it's like to hear Jesus speak. My prayer for you today, you will seek to know the Lord, your God, and to hear his voice.